Hello, dear students. Welcome to everyone to our channel. Today, we will have a conference. Why the Holocaust? Part one, the dark side. Our guest today, directly from Italy, is Dr. Pierluigi Tombetti, historian Hello. and the author of uh, several books. Welcome to our channel, Dr. Pierre Luigi. Bruno and I are very happy of your participation in our channel. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Right, so uh, can I start, Joyce? Yeah, please. All right. So we will see why the Holocaust. In history, um, we try to give answers to the question how, but the most important is, uh, the most important one is why. Uh, so in this lecture, you won't find usual dates, usual figures, usual names, usual uh, history of the Holocaust, because we will dig deeper, uh, much deeper, and we will discover uh, a truth even worse than we normally know. Um, and for the most part, little known even uh, among specialists. So expect the unexpected. This is the dark side of history, but it is all absolutely true. So uh, why the Holocaust? You know, the historical, social, and um, economic reasons normally given are fundamentally correct, but they are only a part a part of the emerged part of the iceberg. Uh, and they cannot fully justify what, what happened. So let's see the first image, the first picture. Uh, please, Joyce. Because, uh, you know, the term Holocaust, let's see now the etymology of, of the word. Would you show the first? Uh, may we see the first one, Joyce? I don't see the, the picture. This? Holocaust etymology, I don't see it. Do, uh, is it on screen? Do, do you see yeah, it? Yeah, it's the screen, yeah. Okay, because I don't see it. Huh? Okay. Uh, well, when you, see, when you say holocaust, it, it comes from the Greek holocaust, meaning um, a, a sacrifice from holos, whole, whole body, and kaustos, meaning burned. Uh, so it is a religious sacrifice that is completely burned to ashes. Uh, and now specialists prefer the term shoah, simply meaning catastrophe or complete destruction, just to avoid the idea of a religious purpose. But you know, the Holocaust, the Holocaust remains and the sacrifice remains. So the real question is a sacrifice to whom? And the final answer to the question why the Holocaust uh, emerges very clearly in the investigations of uh, Carl Gustav Jung, the great Swiss uh, psychologist, who enormously uh, broadened the horizons of psychoanalysis. He discovered the real causes of Nazism uh, by seeking this answer in what he called the land of shadow, the land of shadow, that is a dark side of human mind. So Jung, before Hitler's advent in, um, in the 20s and 30s of the past century, uh, studying the dreams of his patients. Uh, they were mm, Austrian, Swiss, German, Nordic, Nordic in general. So he discovered a series of archetypal symbols that identified two aspects of the German um, mentality, a strong warrior uh, violence and an equally strong need for a metaphysical salvation. And he called this two faces of their personality, uh, Wotanodin archetype, because Wotan, 
the god as we see the next please Joyce the next image image okay. two. Um, Botany is the god of the gods of the Germanic pantheon had the same characteristics. Now in Norse dramas uh, like Voluspa or Edda or others it is told how Votan, uh, the warrior god who celebrates the battles in Valhalla with his heroes, hanging, as you see here, from the sacred tree, uh, ash tree Yggdrasil, also Axis Mundi, in meditation for nine nights, uh, receives the initiatory knowledge of the runes. So violence, you see, and mysticism, uh, and, uh, and these are two parts or hallmarks of the Nazism. Um, that's interesting that the word folk in German language um, does not have a literal counterpart in other languages. It doesn't mean only people or race. Uh, you know, Volkswagen is not exactly the car of the people because folk is the community of people who feels the need for a higher spirituality, the Germanic one, vibrating in their blood. It is a ring of people, a concept that transcends national boundaries uh, by encompassing vari various populations uh, on, of Northern Europe. So Jung studied Germany on his uh, psychologist coach and um, his extra, extraordinary uh, analysis of the common symbols in the dreams, in the nightmares of the folk songs uh, reveal, reveals that they unconsciously waited for um, an eschatological messiah able to save them from a terrible situation that of World War I, uh, post-war post period after the Versailles, uh, Versailles Treaty. And they waited for a Messiah able to give them the political, but above all social and the spiritual unity uh, that they have been trying to achieve for centuries. Just for example, have you ever uh, found yourself in a situation of crisis? I think everyone, eh? But the root of the Greek word from which crisis derives, and you know, Greek language is very close to German language, means a choice. Crisis, for, uh, from the verb krino in, uh, krino in, um, in Greek, means separate, or figuratively, I decide. I decide which. Uh, when we are in crisis, it means that whether we are aware of it or not, uh, our mind tells, tells us that we have to make a choice. We have, to, we have come to a fork uh, on the road and we have to choose right or left. Uh, it's time to take a decision, to, take, uh, to choose a way for good. So the state of crisis ends when we have taken a pondered decision and we set out on the new road with, uh, without looking back. Now, applying um, the Jung's view filter on history, it appears clear that Germany uh, in the 1920s, immediately after World War I, is in crisis. Is in crisis, just like one person, because it is made of uh, 80 million people with a fragmented and divided personalities who do not know their true selves. Why? is that. Um, historically, historically, for centuries, Germany uh, remained divided into small regions, continuously uh, strangling each other. And the desire for a political and social unity uh, of the folk was um, constantly disappointed, even by the Second Reich of Bismarck, 1871. But we must remember it is uh, a strong metaphysical and social tension. It, it's not only political. So this desire for unity, very intense and never satisfied, created a curious and very unusual a peculiar effect. Not finding a way out, the Germans began to look back in a sort of 
a nostalgia for the origins of the time of the barbarians, of the berserk power, or the wolf warriors, um, to the mythos, in one word. And this turning back, especially through the Richard Wagner uh, dramas, is a, a phenomenon that scholars identify as regressus ad uterum, uh, meaning re return to the time when one felt safe in a mother's womb. Uh, for example, for instance, have you ever seen the movie Savi, um, Saving Private Ryan? In that movie, that's interesting, when the young soldiers in the hell of bullets of the D-Day and the terror of battle screamed out mummy, that word mummy, uh, this is regressus ad uterum, meaning the mind immediately turns back to that lost and secure and safe time. So Germans needed the security of their ancient mother, German cultural and religious uh, background, lost in century of uh, divisions. And the Third Reich gave them, um, gave it to them. Jung would say in a spiritual self-realization. Self so a fragmented self, uh, divided self, retrieves finally its parts, unified them in one Reich, one government, one symbol, the swastika. Now it's clear, it's clear why Jung, uh, uh, Jung's studies contributes, contributed so much to the question why the Holocaust. And with the Third Reich, the land of shadow, the dark side comes out and enters, enters directly into reality, the very pragmatic Hitler's regime. An example, an example are the runes. For example, the rune Sieg victory in the SS symbol, everyone know, know it, knows it, uh, and many others. So let, let's talk about the, the runes and their use in the Third Reich. The Third Reich. So we talked, uh, we talked before about the regressus ad uterum and um, I think in the case of Germany mean, uh, means uh, turning back to the mythos that is the dark uh, mythological and dreamlike universe inherent in the mind of the sons of the Germanic folk. Uh, it is there, Jung, uh, Jung tells us, that the archetypal symbols of the folk live, it's there. This is important because uh, the runes exist, are born, and move in the, in, into the mythos, inside the mythos. That is, as archetypal signs, uh, they, the runes are part uh, of the background, but also of the Germanic mind. Uh, they are inherent. They are used because they are part of the, the, the recovery uh, of the ancient Germanic culture uh, made by the Third Reich. So, what are the runes? They are not born as a, a normal alphabet. They are not it, exactly. But they are the magic alphabet of the Druids in use since the first and the second um, century AD. And they were used mainly to foretell the future, engraved on sticks or pebbles uh, that were thrown to the ground and um, interpreted. The Nazis reused them following the spread of Ariosophy in Austria, in Austria and Germany in the decades before Hitler. A philosophy very similar um, to the Nazi one uh, and which considered the runes vector uh, or carrier or magical, of magical power and able to control the masses. So the runes are highlighted in every aspect of public life. Please, let's see uh, the picture three, um, Joyce. Okay. Um, and, and you see, this is not only a, an histor a historical recovery, because we must remember that it is in mythos or on the Yggdrasil tree that uh, Odin Wotan receives the magical wisdom on the runes which he communicates to mankind. So the runes, the runes are therefore um, uh, a symbolic apparatus uh, that has a precious purpose to remind the Germans uh, of their past, to connect them 
directly to it, but also, and above all, to throw reality into the hand of mythos, bringing, so in this way, uh, the land of its shadow into the real world and permeating, permeating uh, politics with, uh, of occultism. Now, let's talk about the swastika. Swastika is not essentially a rune, it's not a rune. Uh, someone can see, someone see, uh, sees that as two uh, signs, sig or victory, uh, cross, crossing, crossed. Uh, the swastika symbol is very ancient. Um, maybe the most ancient symbol of mankind, religious symbol. And, um, it is used, it is in use uh, all over the ancient and modern world from east to west, from Japan to Native Americans, uh, uh, to Etruscans, also Romans, also the Germanic tribes that called it Thor's Cross. And uh, Svastika uh, comes from uh, a Sanskrit word, Suasti, meaning uh, I wish you prosperity, I wish you luck. So let, let's see, please, uh, the next uh, picture, Coca-Cola, use flag and Vastica, we see something unusual. Um, because in the early years of the 20th century in England uh, and the USA, it was commonly seen, the Vastica was commonly seen on cigarettes, packs, greeting cards, even ending up on some Coca-Cola gadgets, as we, see here, as we see here, and even used by the Boy Scouts. Uh, it, had, it had nothing to link it to the concept of evil or uh, to evil deeds, evil deeds. On the contrary, it was um, a wish for prosperity. Now, uh, the next picture about the Sheffer expedition, 1938, 1939, uh, please. Uh, in 1938, Himmler, uh, the SS leader sent an expedition of SS scientists to Tibet, led by uh, the explorer and zoologist uh, M. Schaeffer, to determine whether Tibet was the cradle, or was the, the place uh, of the Aryan race. And uh, the, the taking of cranial measure, measurements and making of facial uh, casts of local people by uh, Bruno Berger, who was the anthropologist of the expedition, little did to confirm it. But the swastika, as you know from this picture, was the common archetypal religious sign. Uh, this symbol opened every door, every door. And members of the expedition, uh, all of them were welcomed uh, with all honors as ambassadors of a Narian people like the Tibetans. So uh, let's see the, the swastika, uh, image five, please, swastika flag. Uh, you know, the swastika is a symbol, a solar symbol. As the sun gives life, it wishes life, but it is also a symbol of cyclical rebirth and it has four arms, as you see here, in circular uh, rotation, meaning four seasons, so rebirth after death, fertility, uh, and so on. And um, the whole symbolic apparatus of the Third Reich is not born by chance at all, but is studied in depth uh, with the declared aim uh, of obtaining a vast and an immediate effect on the masses. And in Mein Kampf, Hitler writes that the swastika symbolizes the struggle for the affirmation of the Aryan nation, uh, Aryan man. So in reality, the, mm, the meaning that Hitler attributes to the swastika comes from theosophy and Ariosophy, of which, uh, we, of which we shall speak later. And the Third Reich assimilates uh, these philosophies and chooses the oldest religious symbol in the world as a symbol uh, of a national socialist party. Why? Because it perfectly uh, sums up the true objective of Nazism, the realization of the Aryan self, that is the return to the golden age, to the golden uh, age of Aryans, through eugenic and 
spiritual purification. And René Guénon, uh, the, the great scholar of spiritual movements, uh, together with Jung, explained that the Crux Gammata, uh, or, or Achenkreuz, Achenkreuz the, the swastika, like all the Crux or crosses, is made with a central point, as you see in the, in the picture. And um, the point is a mathematical symbol of perfection. And also in history or religion, uh, of religion and uh, in symbolism, uh, it is the archetype of the divine, of God. And the four arms symbolize the path to reach God, path to God. In the case of Nazism, uh, we reach the Sonnenmensch, the, the solar man, as the swastika is a clear sign. So the spiritually realized Aryan. And Jung sees, um, in, sees it, um, or sees in the swastika the reunification of a fragmented national self that finally finds its recomposition. And it is also, we call we can see it also uh, a mandala, you know. A mandala um, is a center of attraction leading to uh, spiritual fulfillment. And uh, because we can say also the swastika is um, um, also a dynamic sign. It, it rotates to the right for the nazis uh, and its dynamism, dynamism also represents uh, represents a man with two arms and two legs, a head uh, in motion. Uh, the goal is the return the, uh, on the path uh, to the true Germanic essence, the state of perfection of the Aryans, lost aborigine since the beginning. So it also symbolizes Thule. Thule is the North Pole, the legendary home of the Aryans. And uh, let's see next picture, picture six. This is a lesson on swastika um, uh, because it, the swastika is a perfect sign that is impressed, impressed literally in the crowds, even if they do not know exactly its meaning, uh, which is explained only to the high ranking officers uh, of the SS, as we see in the picture. Uh, keepers of this secret knowledge. And why does the symbol rotate? Uh, dextro rotatory or right rotating, uh, just to, to give an example, let's uh, imagine a screw that screws into the wood. So it symbolizes the way to reach the point uh, that is the status, the status of Aryan divinity. But level rotatory or left rotating symbolizes drifting away from the point. So it is simply a uh, fall from the state of perfection, the, the estrangement from God that for the third right is caused by mixing what I defined superior and inferior races. Right, after this uh, interesting guest courses on the symbols, uh, the question why the Holocaust requires we understand where did the national, where did national socialism come from? Uh, let's say something about that. Uh, towards the end of the 20th century, the trend of the search uh, for the true religion that would be hidden within the most ancient and widespread uh, sacred text uh, spread, spread uh, throughout the world, uh, all over the world. It was talked about everywhere. The salons of the old and new um, world were thrilled when lecture, lectures were held on these topics, uh, which flowed into a new Weltanschauung, meaning worldview, uh, called theosophy which greatly, uh, it, it is a sort of uh, new religion, new kind of religion that influenced Nazism. And many VIPs of the time, very important persons, uh, became theosophists. As uh, next picture, please, Joyce, 
picture seven, Arthur Conan Doyle, who is a famous theosophist. And also uh, Percy Harrison Fawcett, the next image, um, the visionary explorer who died seeking for the lost city of the Aryans in the Amazon basin and became the model for Spielberg's uh, Indiana Jones. So Theosophy was created by uh, this woman, uh, please picture nine. Elena Petrovna Blavatsky. Uh, she was a Russian adventurer, adventurer and uh, medium uh, uh, scholar uh, who founded an international center of studies and opened branches all over the world. And um, the, the theosoph theosophy, Blavatsky New Religion, had as fundamental point uh, these ones. Uh, we, we see it in the next picture, picture 10, please. So the point one is the fall from original perfection or Aryan golden age, she talked about Aryans, is, is due to uh, the miscegenation or mixing of different races. And this is important because it is a concept uh, of original sin. Then point two, the chaos in the world or the evil in the world is resolved by restoring a, sup a single superior uh, race through uh, biological and spiritual purification, eugenetics. So this is a solution of the theosophy of uh, the problem, the evil in the world, mysterium uh, iniquitatis. The third point, it is necessary to create a, a group of people with, uh, with a, a, a deeper spiritual knowledge to take on the temporal and spiritual leadership of the new civilization. And this ones will have their, this is interesting and also terrible. Uh, this was, will have their correspondent in the 12 SS Gruppenführer or Himmler's supreme leaders in the Weversburg castle. Uh, they were initiated to um, occult knowledge as priests and spiritual leaders. And uh, point four, the, the ancient homeland of the Aryan civilization uh, was to be located in uh, Thule or uh, the North Pole. And the Nazi party was born from a secret society as we, we will see called Thule Gesellschaft or Thule Society. And also Himmler chose uh, Weversburg Castle as the seat of the, of the uh, SS cult uh, precisely because it was like uh, an arrow, uh, this was the form, towards, oriented towards the north, uh, the hyperboreal Thule. And five, the use of swastika in modern times begin just with theosophy, which makes it the object of a profound study and uses it um, with the same meaning of Hitler. So you see how many elements we will find in national socialist doctrine. And we must say, uh, theosophy uh, spread enormously in Germany, which literally drank from its knowledge, precisely because the German nation, as we said before, was like a person in crisis, trying to find its way, but um, a person or a country who didn't, did not know which one uh, which way <laughs> was its way. Uh, Folkish emotional and metaphysical movements were incorporated and channeled by, in, uh, by theosophy, which made uh, it, uh, of it, of them, uh, a true religion. And uh, theosophy underwent uh, a transformation and from re religion began to orient itself toward national, um, nationalist politics when it was taken over by a group of Turkish philosophers uh, of the folk movement who saw the ancient lost wisdom of the Aryans. So let's see the next picture, please. 
Guido von Liszt and Lanz von Liebenfels. Uh, particularly in Vienna, they, they began to speak about Ariosophy. This, uh, the occult doctrine revealed, revealed through visions, especially by these two characters, Guido von Liszt and Jörg Lanz von Liebenfels, uh, whose, uh, whose public publications Hitler read greedily, you could say, as a young man spending the few money uh, he had to purchase them in uh, Vienna. And both, uh, both of them, Liszt and Liebenfels, uh, lived in Hitler's time and carried out a ponderous study on Gnost Gnostic religions and especially on the runes seen as dispensers of mystical wisdom and signs of power capable of controlling the will of the masses. And the Svastika sign became, became fundamental as a symbol of returning to the divine Aryan origin, just like the theosophy. And also, uh, it's very important, uh, very important is the fact that the Ariosophers uh, were pushing toward the creation of an occult uh, spiritual orders, order of initiatives to the Aryan wisdom, which were to lead Germany and Austria towards a new spiritual and political order. The purpose, returning to the ancient Aryan golden age, just like Theosophy. Let's see, please, the next image, uh, uh, Ostara magazine. Mm, the theories uh, of the Ariosopher were widespread. Just think that Lanz von Liebenfels magazine, Ostara, sold 100,000 100, copies in Austria alone with a capillary distribution. And Hitler, as we said before, he, when he was young and lived in Vienna, had an almost complete collection of Ostara. And he was fervent in, in, uh, with him, his uh, roommates about Ariosophy, which he defended wholeheartedly. And he spent all little money he had to buy this magazine. And this is to tell, um, to tell you how much he assimilated the ideas of the Ariosophers. And in Mein Kampf, Hitler's uh, book, uh, he says that it was in that time in Vienna that his uh, Weltanschauung, a worldview, was built. So let's see now, let's sum up uh, which theories of the Ariosophers we will find in National Socialism. Uh, let's see uh, the next uh, picture, please. Uh, 13, Ariosophic teachings. We see uh, in point one, uh, the concept of evil identified with the so-called inferior races. Uh, this is terrible, I must say, huh? terrible. But to restore the world to its original state of Aryan perfection, it is necessary to destroy the non-Aryan races. So it was planned slavery, slavery of the non-Aryan races and their holocaust in honor of the pagan god Christ Frauja. It was, I think, an imaginary uh, god. <laughs> but uh, so Land von Liebenfels uh, planned for, mm, to use for this purpose any scientific purpose, uh, as a discovery, sorry. Lanz proposes, uh, for example, uh, X rays and even worse uh, things for uh, eugenic um, attempts, uh, castration and sterilization in a fight called Holy Crusade against the inferior races. We find similar expressions in Hitler's Mein Kampf. And this fact is very important, it's fundamental because it reveals that the final solution and the Holocaust planned at the Vanzi uh, conference in 20 January, 20 January 1942 had its basis in the Ariosophical ideology. And if the aim is to return, as the Ariosophers and Hitler himself asserted, to the new world order or new world Aryan order, that is the golden age of the Aryans, it is an essentially religious goal, a religious goal. From the fall to perfection, a return to the, 
to the spiritual and biological realization of the Aryan symbolized by the swastika. So when we talk, of, when we talk about the Third Reich, we are talking about not exactly a form of politics, but we are talking of a hidden religious ideology that openly uses politics uh, for a spiritual purpose and that chose as its symbol, uh, the most ancient religious symbol of mankind. Then uh, in point two, we see uh, Ariosopher, the Ariosophers plan to create monasteries where uh, Aryan males would join uh, with unmarried women uh, of pure race to give birth to pure Aryan children. And the same will happen with Himmler's Leben Lebensborn. Uh, please, Joy, let's see uh, the 14 uh, Lebensborn, uh, uh, where young unmarried German women will give a child to the Führer, thanks to selected young SS males and that is, uh, that, that is simply eugenic selection, selection. Now let's start, uh, let's uh, mm, uh, return to the uh, former image. Uh, so we, we see at point three, th there is a need for a creation uh, of a nationalist movement that through political force will bring Germanic people back to their true uh, Aryan spiritual essence. And this is uh, an, an idea uh, clearly expressed, expressed by Hitler in uh, the Mein Kampf. Uh, point four, use of astrology and other techniques include, including ecstatic vision. Uh, this was planned by the Ariosopher to rediscover the uh, ancient traditions of the Aryan people. Now, uh, the most of us know that Hitler and his closest collaborators uh, literally depended on their mediums and astrologers. In addition, we can say that Himmler's spiritual director, <laughs> a terrible word to be used this way, the old general Karl Maria Willigut, had the Weversburg Castle, yes, has headquarters, uh, rebuilt according uh, to his visions, and thanks to them, to them uh, elaborated the rituals to be performed inside the crypt. And five, an elite of warrior monks and priests would lead the new Aryan order from a castle uh, as the seat of the order. This would be realized in practice by Himmler at the SS uh, Vivesburg um, Castle. Now, an important point, uh, in uh, 1912, the members of the Berlin Lodge uh, of the Guido von Liszt Ariosophical Society moved uh, to the newly formed German Order. German Order was uh, a secret society, later called Tula Society, from which the Nazi party will be born. So let's see, please, uh, let's go to the 15 uh, uh, picture, uh, picture 15, Origins of National Socialist Thought. This fact is very important. It's very important because it shows that there is a direct connection. The very ancient occult, gnostic, alchemical currents and folkish movements joined and uh, were collected by, from, by theosophy and were used by ariosophy and brought directly into the heart of the newborn Nazi party. And, and this is the story. Yeah, we, also we can join that philosophy, the importance of philosophy, of course. Uh, this was enormous. Uh, from Nietzsche to Hegel, uh, the theories of the Superman and the absolute state, the crowds directly into the hands of the Third Reich. But this is, this is a known history. What is little known instead, or less known, is the enormous influence um, of theosophy and ariosophy. Now, the next step, let's talk about the birth of National Socialism from two-legged esoteric uh, society to the, nation, uh, to the Third Reich. Uh, this brings us to the years, to the years following uh, World War I. Uh, the defeat plunged um, suffered 
plunged Germany uh, into despair. Uh, disastrous economic and social conditions formed the basis for an emotional and um, psychic rebellion. It was strengthened by the Aristotelian theories, which seemed to be seemed to be the only ones to unite the German people or German folk in this way in this case, because they gave voice not to Germany but to the German. Um, um, desire for a higher spirituality, mixing nationalistic violence with, with spiritual research. Do you remember the Botan Odin archetype? And um, supported the advent of a new king messiah of which uh, Carl Gustav Jung found the traces in the dreams of the Germans. So now the regressus ad uterum uh, began to make the Germans uh, turn back to the mythos. Ariosophical um, theories were widely discussed uh, in the thousand, literally thousand of nationally, um, of, we could say, uh, nationalist associations in Germany. And one of these was the German Orden, the German Orden, uh, which was uh, founded in 1912 and soon became the most powerful secret nationalist um, uh, society. And in the German and Orden, uh, esoteric rituals and meditation from the Sufi mystics uh, and Oriental masters combined with racist and national, uh, nationalist uh, intentions. So their target was to lead and awake uh, the Germans to become Zonenmensch, uh, swastika was uh, uh, their symbol, and they wanted to bring Germany to its golden, um, golden Aryan age. Now we have the logo of the Thule Gesellschaft, please picture six, 16. Um, the German Orden changed its name in 1918 in Thule society. So remember, Thule, according uh, Germanic traditions was the home of the Aryan um, men gods. In 1919, inside the Tula society, um, was founded its political wing, the DAP, Deutsche Arbeiter Partei, or uh, German Workers' Party. And in September 1999, Hitler, uh, at that time working as a spy or the police, decided to join the Tula Society and became its most prominent member, uh, changing its name in Nationalist, uh, National Socialist German Workers' Party, um, NSDAP, uh, the Third Reich. So let's see in the next uh, picture of Hitler's membership card, 17. It is useful to say that in the Tula Society, we will meet uh, uh, either as members or just as visiting speakers, uh, many of the future, future hierarchs of the Third Reich. Rudolf Hess, who flew to Scotland in 1941, the philosopher or uh, Nazism Alfred Rosenberg, the future governor of Poland, Hans Frank, and many, many others. So let's, uh, let's summarize uh, what has been said so far. Theosophy collected the religious knowledge of the past and created the, a new religion. Ariosophy took possession of it and directed it toward politics to reach the same target, a new Aryan golden age. Philosophy with Hegel, Nietzsche, etc., appealed, appealed to the emotions of the folk and pushed them toward, uh, towards uh, a self-realization that manifests the two faces of the Votan Odin archetype violence and mysticism. And Nazism put all together and uh, put into practice these teachings uh, through its uh, political machine, uh, including the Holocaust of the disabled ones as planned by the Ariosophers, and of races considered inferior to a pagan god. So we could say the Third Reich is the German mythos moved into the reality arena. 
Now, just to make uh, things clear, we'll consider a question. Uh, is national socialism a religion? It is an appropriate question because as we will see, there are many clues that lead us to a clear answer. Let's see this picture, the 18, the, the buckles got me tunsed, uh, picture 18. So why did the German combat units had the engraving got me tunes or got with is with us on their uniform buckle? Yes, it was a, an old uh, Austro-Hungarian tradition, but Nazism breaks with all previous traditions to, to, to reconnect with, directly with mythos. And the, send, uh, the Third Reich sent its troops to fight in the name of God. This is strange. Normally, it is, uh, it is, not, uh, it is not known. In fact, Hitler, uh, Rosenberg, Himmler, and most of the leaders of the Third Reich often claimed that the national socialism presupposed, assumed uh, belief in God. We find it expressed several times in Mein Kampf. A national socialist is a believer, a believer by definition. Um, one cannot be an easy, it was said, uh, without believing in God. But every, every religion has its rights, its cults. So we'll see now only some, there are many, of um, uh, many public and private cults revealing a clear religious ideology. Because the Nazis, uh, you know, they, they wanted to replace uh, the traditional religion of Christianity with a new one create, by creating a, um, a calendar of party celebrations that gradually will replace the traditional um, religious holidays. So let's see the next picture, the blood fane, the blood flag. This was the flag stained with the blood of the first fallen Nazis in the Putsch of 1923. Um, this is interesting because the Nazis built a real cult of the dead, of the first fallen of the party. They did it with this right, the blood fane or the blood flag. Twice a year on November 9th, the, verse, um, the day of the putsch, and on the day of the party congress, uh, the blood fane, or the flag, was displayed and put into contact with the new banners of the army. Uh, and this to give them the same energetic power uh, linked, to, linked to the Aryan, pure Aryan blood. Uh, because, you know, the, for the Nazis, uh, pure Aryan blood is the very substance of, uh, of divinity. In archive footage, we have uh, in many institutes um, uh, reels in which the, the content with the flag, videos or films, um, and um, explain this. And the, the contact with the flag lasted two or three seconds in which Hitler seems to be in silent meditation or just something like a prayer. Now, let's see the picture 20, the commemoration of the Nazi martyrs. Here we see the commemoration of the dead of the Nazi party in 1923. Uh, we can clearly observe the deeply solemn and religious atmosphere with steaming braziers, um, a silent procession, uh, banners, the solemn, serious posture of the participant who deeply believe in these public cards. Uh, next picture, please, in the Nuremberg Rally, 1934, uh, the Nazi often resorted to sacred public rights, especially in Munich or Nuremberg, the most important ceremonies were also broadcasted by radio with almost national uh, coverage. The ceremony was surrounded by a very suggestive atmosphere obtained with uh, the use of torches, of flags, sacred flames, and ended with an oath, an oath uh, by all the presents, uh, all presents. And the effect, according to the testimonies, 
was that of a great religious meetings. So another another uh, peculiar uh, picture uh, of the bapti SS baptism, consecration of the name. Let's see this, 21. Another aspect of the Nazi secret cult was the so-called, uh, this ceremony, consecration, consecration of the name. This is a, uh, an SS interpretation of, of baptism. Uh, a newborn son of SS. Uh, here you can see on the, uh, the altar on which was placed uh, a picture, a photography of Hitler. Simply speaking, a, an icon. It was an icon which replaced that of, uh, of Christ as the Messiah. Uh, the icon of Hitler blesses the pure race infant uh, who from that moment on become, uh, becomes part of the Third Reich. And this is, uh, no, you see in the center, no longer the cross of Christianity, but we see the Aachen Kreuz, the swastika. And no priest. The priest now is a high-ranking SS official. Uh, another picture, 22, Algis uh, Rune, the um, SS, SS Tomb Cross. Uh, the, Nazi, um, the Nazi party replaces uh, the traditional religion with a new new pagan ideology and the runes become fundamental as true religious symbols. It replaces the cross, you see here, for the SS. And the rune of death, the rune Algit, is played as a pole and two segments joined to the, the pole and open it upwards, symbolizes a, a man with um, his arm outstretched to the heaven because the, this rune is uh, the request of, uh, for protection from above. No cross, no more cross for the SS, but a room. So let's see next picture, 23. Hitler icon uh, venerated uh, in homes as a saint or, or uh, a messiah. In this picture, we see the icon of Hitler venerated, worshipped in German uh, houses instead of that of Christ or of saint. Hitler is now become uh, the, uh, the, the savior, the savior of Germany, Messiah. This can also be seen clearly from the salutation Heil Hitler. Heil Hitler literally in, uh, in German language uh, means salvation be belongs to Hitler. So with this salutation, Adolf Hitler was recognized as the savior, as the the Messiah, and therefore uh, the Christ, meaning anointed uh, by God, sent by God. And, and if national socialism is a religion, uh, Italy is its Messiah. And in Mein Kampf, he himself clearly describes this mission. Now, uh, the next information comes from the only book uh, um, published about Mein Kampf that selects and stresses Hitler's view on God's uh, edited by the speaker. So let's see the next picture, 24, the commandment that arises. Uh, the text reads, the commandment that arises uh, is to put an end to the original sin, still operating of poisoning, of the poisoning of the race and to give to the almighty creator uh, beings such as he himself created. And terrible words. Because if we carefully examine Hitler words in Mein Kampf, we can, on the basis of uh, what we have already said, identify some aspects of uh, fundamental importance. Hitler is a deep believer. Hitler uses the sentence, the commandment that arises. This can only mean that he feels that he is the agent, the uh, emissary of a salvific mission. The mission is the commandment of a sacred law uh, and therefore a religious crusade. And uh, in this world, we see also uh, that there is a, an original scene that has unleashed chaos 
and spread evil in the world. And uh, the National Socialist uh, mission is to put an end, as we see here, uh, to original sin, both biological and spiritual. It is racial dec decadence due to the miscegenation or mixing of superior and inferior races, and to bring the Aryan race back to its true uh, divine nature, the Sonnenmensch in German, or solar man. Then next picture, 25, please. Uh, we see another, another um, sentence from um, Mein Kampf. Hitler's words. The result of each miscegenation, a mixing of inferior and superior races, is in short the following. A, lowering the levels of superior race, race and physical and spiritual degeneration of the beginning and the beginning of a slow and inexorable contagion. Contributing to such a mixture is therefore sinning against the will of the creator. And this way of acting is in fact punished as a sin. His action against nature inevitably leads him to ruin. This is, these are Hitler's words in Mein Kampf. So let's identify some points. Racist misdenation is therefore the cause the reason of a very, very serious sin against the creator, the creator. In short, it is the original sin of theosophy and the Ariosophical doctrines. The mixing aborigine of the lineage of the semi-Aryan gods with races considered inferior. And this would have led not only to biological decline, decline but to spiritual decline. And the National Socialist Mission represents, in Hitler's uh, uh, book, the will of God, the will of God. And Hitler claims to act on his behalf in bringing man back to his own divinity. Um, so in Mein Kampf, a real theology emerges uh, with the conception of a, an Aryan paradise uh, in a very ancient golden age. Thule. He speaks of an original sin, mixing with the inferior races. A strong stance is therefore necessary to, to guide, to lead the Aryans to, that, to their true spiritual nature. And the Armageddon, that is World War II, uh, is necessary to, uh, because he wanted the complete elimination of the so-called inferior races through the Holocaust. And this is necessary to bring the world back to the millennial Reich of Aryan peace and prosperity. This is uh, really, uh, it's, a, it's terrible speaking this way, but this is the true uh, Third Reich. So we discovered the final answer why the Holocaust. The final answer is an eschatological answer. The philosophy that drives national socialism is an eschatologic, salvific vision of, of Weltanschau that literally, literally uh, burns millions of individuals in an holocaust, a burnt sacrifice, offered to the deity of the Aryan blood. This is the true reality of the Third Reich. And the National Socialist Party born from a secret society of occultists based on racist and evil philosophies, which uses the old religious sign in the world, the swastika, as a symbol and restores the runes and ancient pagan cults, replacing the Christian ones. So everybody uh, knows, each and every one knows what happened. What hidden under the political ideology of the Third Reich, an external facade to conceal an objective that has little to do with politics, a new Aryan world order. Uh, so this conclude, concludes the first part of our conference uh, on the reasons for the Holocaust. As I warned you um, at the be beginning, 
at the opening. This is the dark side of history, but it's all absolutely true. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Pierre Luigi, to, to share with us this how interesting information. And uh, we show now uh, one of the books of you. If you ah, can you. explain for the students, please. Uh, yes, um, this is a thriller because I, I write uh, historical essays, but uh, also um, an author of a thriller. And this is very interesting, uh, Synchronicity Flight 9941, because it deals with the new um, discoveries of um, quantum physics. It deals with uh, uh, a London, uh, there are events on the edge of reality uh, in this uh, London, uh, New York, night flight on plane. And unusual circumstances slowly begin to manifest themselves. Um, uh, very particular, discovered by the Swiss psychologist Jung, as I, we, we talked about him before, and the father of quantum physics, Wolfgang Pauli. They discovered synchronicity. The synchronicity is something, well, I, I, don't want to, I don't want to explain too much, but this is a fascinating story, able to overturn normal points of view on what we are and what we see from quantum entanglement to our consciousness from synchronicity to the collective unconscious uh, this book is uh, uh, with this book i wanted to create the threshold the threshold of direct connection uh, between um, the mind and the universe following uh, the teachings of Jung and uh, Pauli. So it's very interesting. Maybe we could see the, the book trailer. Is it possible? Yeah. Then we can conclude the conference. Dr. Pierre Luigi, for your conference, uh, we just uh, are learning uh, many points of um, very interesting. So, me and Bruno would like to say thank you so much for you accepted our invitation of your participation in our channel, and already we have a, a expectative to receive to receive uh, more information in the part two of your conference. Okay, okay. Thank you very much to you, to you both, Bruno and Joyce, and to all the students and uh, all interested ones who attended this conference or follow it on YouTube. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. See you soon. Bye bye. Arrivederci.